Humans, like you and I, need air. We need a little while sitting, more while walking, and a good amount when running. But some animals fly, and birds especially fly high and far, needing a huge amount of oxygen to power their wings, with some birds traveling many hundreds of miles without landing. And more impressively, they do this at elevations of up to 11,300 meters, or 37,000 feet. That's 8,000 feet above the peak of Mount Everest, and is about as high as commercial airliners fly. At this elevation, you or I would pass out within seconds and die within minutes. So how do they not only survive, but fly at this height? Birds, along with other archosaurs, which are crocodilians, pterosaurs, and of course dinosaurs, have a different respiratory system than us mammals. Our lungs act essentially like balloons. When we inhale, they inflate with air, oxygen is absorbed, and then they deflate, pushing most of the air out. But birds use a different method. They have what is called a unidirectional respiratory system. This system essentially functions with four phases, unlike the two of ours. Birds have essentially a collection of posterior air sacs, air sacs at the back of the body, anterior air sacs, ones at the front of the body, and a collection of rigid tubes used to perform gas exchange or absorb oxygen, which, despite the anatomical differences, are termed lungs. On the first inhale, air is sucked into the posterior air sacs, then during the first exhale, that air is pushed through the lungs, and then during the second inhale, that air is pushed out of the lungs into the anterior air sac, and finally, during the second exhale, that air is finally expelled from the body through the trachea. This functionally means that new air is constantly being pushed into the lungs, maintaining a semi-constant rate of oxygen absorption. Semi-constant, of course, because during any given inhale and exhale, there are four waves of slightly increased air pressure moving through the body. One being inhaled into the posterior air sacs, one being pushed into the lungs from those air sacs, one being pushed out of the lungs, and one being exhaled. The result of these large, strong air sacs is that the total volume of the avian respiratory system is about twice that of mammals of comparable size. And this air sac system is not only large, but very complicated, extending into the bones of the spine, rib cage, and hip. Furthermore, the lungs of birds, instead of using alveoli like we do, they simply use capillaries, which are less than a tenth the size of alveoli, which in combination with the rigidness of the lung allows them to be packed far more tightly and have an increased surface area as compared to our lungs, despite being a far less voluminous structure. These adaptations together allow birds to thrive at even the lowest oxygen levels, and more than that, fly over great distances. For reference, the whooper swan, a relatively heavy and dense bird, has been recorded flying at an elevation during migration where the effective oxygen level was around 7.4%, where humans would pass out and die pretty quickly below 10%. But how did this system arise in birds? And why is their respiratory system so different from ours? To understand this, we need to go back to the appearance of birds, and much further back still. Birds first appeared in the late Jurassic with the earliest known members, including Alcomenevus, Anchiornis, Archaeopteryx, and Archaeornithes. But to see the origin of their abilities, we need to go back even further. During the Permian mass extinction, about 252 million years ago, Global cataclysm resulted in severe dips in oxygen levels. During the previous Permian period, oxygen levels were relatively high, and the dominant organisms, synapsids, did not need particularly efficient respiratory systems to operate. But during the Permian mass extinction, the diapsids, the other branch of fully terrestrial vertebrates, started to undergo not only an increase in size, but an increase in diversity. With this increased size, at the plummeted oxygen levels of the Permian mass extinction, there was a demand for a more efficient respiratory system. It is probable that going into this extinction event, the two groups, synapsids and diapsids, did not have a completely identical respiratory system. It is likely that the diapsids had evolved a very primitive form of, or a precursor to, the unidirectional respiratory system. It could have had a looped anatomy, but lungs that function like ours, or, more likely, it had a lone, weak air sac just to assist in the movement of air through the body. But the pressures of the extinction event supercharged and hyper-refined the development of this respiratory system, pushing it to what would be present when true archosaurs emerged. 
The influence of this respiratory system was also probably a self-reinforcing system. The true archosaurs were seemingly warm-blooded or at least mesothermic when they first emerged. Pterosaurs were, and birds are, warm-blooded groups, and the ancestors of today's crocodilians were also warm-blooded. This more powerful respiratory system that had developed may have made it easier to adopt endothermy, and in reverse, the increased activity resulting from endothermy, in combination with the larger size, may have demanded more efficient respiration. Changes in lifestyle may have also been a similar system. While there is, of course, a significant overlap, when looking at the synapsids and archosaur morphs of the early to middle Triassic, the synapsids are typically more stout and smaller, whereas the archosaur morphs, on average, were thinner, with longer legs and lighter bodies. This anatomy generally indicates a lifestyle demanding more agility and especially efficiency of movement, comparable to the build of coyote, gazelle, or cheetah, as opposed to the build of a honey badger, ground sloth, or prairie dog. Lystrosaurus, the most successful synapsid of the early Triassic, is well known to have been an avid burrower, and it is probable, given the anatomy of the groups at the time, that archosaur morphs were far more prone to migration and movement to avoid unfavorable conditions, whereas the synapsids, with their more stout frames built to dig well, more often burrowed and hunkered down. This is supported not only by the anatomy of the two groups, but by the presence of burrowing behaviors in the great majority of mammals, which are the only living groups of synapsids. This would also explain the other branch of diapsids, lilipedosaurs, which are snakes and lizards, never developing a system like that or as advanced as birds are. They are entirely cold-blooded and would not have nearly the energy and oxygen demand of the archosauromorphs. Over a hundred million years after the early Triassic, with dinosaurs as the dominant force across the planet, one group of theropods, following in the footsteps, or rather wing beats of the pterosaurs, begin to use this advanced respiratory system for flight. From here they developed, and by the late Cretaceous, what anyone would recognize as a bird would have been a common sight in the skies. Before the KPG mass extinction, this respiratory system was present in slightly different forms in dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and some crocodilomorphs. After, with the extinction of most of those groups, it survives only in birds, a simpler, probably regressed form in crocodilians, and a very primitive form in monitor lizards. The highest flying bird today on record is the Rupel's vulture, which reached an elevation of 37,000 feet, which for reference is on the higher end of how high commercial airliners fly. What the purpose of this even was, I honestly don't know. If you enjoyed, don't forget to like and subscribe, and leave your thoughts in the comments below. Have a good day, everyone.